Okay. Hello, everyone, and welcome back to the conference. So this is going to be session 3B, uh, Long-Term Trends and Structural Dynamics. So we have three speakers today, and they're going to be talking about long-term trends in part-time work in the UK and uh, disability employment gaps in the UK and the role of education. And they're measuring the impact of Brexit on migration to Wales. Okay, so our first talk today is um, by Rachel Scar from the University of Edinburgh. And Rachel is an early career researcher and she researches labour economics, focusing on non-standard contracts such as zero hour contracts and part-time work. And she's particularly interested in the interaction between firms, technologies and workers' preferences and how this affects labour markets. And she also has a side interest in studying labour markets in sports to see what they can tell us about labour markets in general. OK, so over to you, Rachel. Great, thank you very much. Um, yes, yes, as, as was just said, this, so this is um, this is a paper about long term trends in, in part time work in the UK. And it's kind of part of a, a general research interest of mine, which is different patterns of work and, and how those have been changing over time. Um, so the, there are two parts to this paper that I'm writing at the moment. The first part is to document some facts about trends in part-time work. Um, and I've kind of split them into to two categories. There's kind of fact one, which is that there's been this long-term increase in the quantity of part-time work in the UK. And I'll talk a bit more about that, what that means in a minute. Um, and then fact two is that at the same time, there's been an increase in the relative price of part-time work. So, so part-time workers now earn more sort of per hour, obviously less absolutely because they work fewer hours, but they are more per hour relative to full-time workers than they did previously. Um, and then the second part of this paper, which I, which I may have time to talk a little bit about today, is to, to build a kind of structural model which incorporates part-time work. So what I want to do is, is to kind of, these are two facts that aren't necessarily, you know, generally we think that if the quantity of something goes up, the, the price might go down, and, and we, that's not what we see in the data here. Um, and so the aim is to build a structural model that can perhaps explain workers and firms' preferences for part versus full-time work, and, and then perhaps explain whether these changes that we see are something to do with, with changes in workers' preferences on the supply side, or whether they're changes from firms kind of on the demand side. Um, and the reason that this is kind of important in, in many ways, obviously, I, I think that, um, but particularly, I think it's it's got a kind of theoretical importance because a lot of the models that we have as economists of the labour market assume that earnings are linear in hours. So if, if you work another hour, you're, the extra amount you get doesn't change if, if you're already working 10 hours a week or if you're already working 40. Um, and as I'll show you, that's just not what we see in the data and, and therefore maybe our models are, are not capturing something important. Um, and it has a policy importance to this question and this topic, I think, um, uh, as, as the inequality in hours, so if more people are working part time, um, that could feed through into inequality in earnings. Um, so there are, there are policy reasons why we might be interested in these trends too. Um, so for the, the empirical part of the paper, I use the quarterly labour force survey. Um, that's kind of ideal for this purposes because we've got this long term data, so it covers the whole business cycle, which is so if you want to look at trends, that's quite important. Um, one thing that has the, the other data set I work with is the ASH, the annual survey of hours and earnings, and that doesn't have the kind of individual characteristics. So things like education um, and particularly important, obviously, for part time and full time work is kind of family, family situation, um, which which we see in, in the LFS. Um, and it also captures the ash sort of fails to capture the very low wage end of the labour market. So people who weren't who aren't earning enough, for instance, to be paying income tax um, are less well captured in the ash. Um, and those are people are, are generally people who work part time. Um, the, the people that I that I kind of focus on here. Um, so I define someone as being part time if they work 30 or fewer hours a week. Um, and, and everything I'm about to show you is kind of is, is not sensitive to exactly where that cutoff is. So, I, so I, I've tried everything with kind of using 35 hours a week as the cutoff, everything using 25. And I find the same trends. Um, I look at people aged between 16 and 64, so that's a kind of whole of, of someone's sort of working life. Um, again, if I if I kind of um, narrow that to 25 to 55, again, I find the same trends. 
Um, and I and I don't I just look at people working between five and 70 hours a week. So not people doing kind of very, very few or sort of implausibly who, who report that they do implausibly long, long numbers of hours a week. Um, so the first fact um, that I said I would talk about was was this increase in the quantity of part time work. Um, so what we see is, is these three three charts show for men, for women and for everyone what we call the part time share. So that's the percentage of people who are working with a part time job. And you can see very, very different trends for, for men than for women. For men, that part time share has, has increased from about just over 6% in 1994 to, to over 12% today. And um, for women, the, the trend has generally been downwards with a little kind of uptick during the financial crisis. Um, so that's that's the first for the first kind of um, first part. So first key fact is that there's been this kind of increase in the part time share. Um, and as well as looking at kind of just part time versus full time dichotomy, I also looked at, at what kind of hours those part time workers were doing. Um, so this is the the proportion of part time workers doing very very few hours on the left. Um, so less than 10 and doing sort of between 21 to 30, so more hours on the right. Um, and you see that fewer, fewer people are working very, very low hours and more people are working sort of two or three days a week. Um, and that's a, that's a kind of that trend is, has been carrying on to increase even after even after the financial crisis. Um, and a consequence of those two facts is that in the economy as a whole, more, more of the work that is being done in, in our economy is being done by part-time workers. Um, so this is what I call the part-time share of all hours. So I, I um, sum all of the hours of work that are being done, um, and then I work out what percentage of them are being done by part-time workers. Um, and you can see on the right that that it's been increasing and um, it's sort of jumped in the financial crisis. It's, it's not clear if this is kind of that that fall since then is kind of going back to to kind of a trend up or if it is is going to be a fall um and and crucially you can see that that trend is driven almost entirely by increases amongst men so this is really a story of men working um more men working part time and and those men working conditional on being part time working for for longer hours um, so that was the kind of the first fact that I found was of interest was this increase in the quantity of part time work. Um, and then the second fact that I, that I found was interesting was it was a change in, in the price, so changing the wages here um, of part time workers. Um, so all that I do here is, is I regress hourly wages. So, um, so hourly wages on, on whether or not someone is working part time. Um, and so, so these um, these three lines plot the the coefficient beta. Um, so it's basically the difference in average hourly wages between part and full time workers for men, which is a black line, uh, for women, which is a blue line, and and then kind of an average for everyone, which is the red line. And you can and this, that that's what we call the part time pay penalty. Um, and you can see that it's it's big, um, it, particularly amongst men. Um, and that's because part-time men tend to be working in very, very low wage jobs. And then at the other end of the spectrum, um, very, very high wage jobs, which tend to be full time, are, are mostly done by men. And so there's a bigger part-time pay penalty on average for, for men. Um, but, but part of that is just due to the kind of the different types of, of job and occupations and industries where you find full and part-time workers. Um, so what I then do is I, is I include a set of controls um, where I control for, for kind of work characteristics, so age, education, experience, all these kind of things, um, and firm characteristics, and then job and occupation. And I call that the adjusted part-time pay penalty. And you can see that it, it's much smaller and it's very similar for men and women, but that even, you know, for people, for very similar people working in very similar type jobs, um, full-time workers are kind of catching up, their pay is catching up, hourly pay, sorry, I should say, is catching up to, to, um, to full-time workers. And, and that's the kind of the second thing that I think they think is quite interesting to, to think a little bit more about. Um, so then the kind of question kind of happen, sort of comes is, is where does that, that part-time pay penalty come from? Um, so where is, is this kind of jump in, um, in, in hourly wages? Um, so what I do here is, is I look at um, sort of weekly earnings. So it's, it's, it's earnings rather than hourly wages now. 
um, and I regress that on on a dummy for kind of bins of hours. So so for everyone working five to ten hours, I put them together, and ten to fifteen, and, and so on and so forth, up to seventy five, sixty five to seventy. Um, so that that allows me to to kind of plot out an hours earnings profile. And you see that for people doing kind of fewer than about 30 hours, it's kind of linear. So that sort of means that their hourly wage is constant. If if you earn, if you work at an hour more, you earn however much more. Um, but then between about 30 and about 35, there's suddenly a big jump. Um, so at, at the point which we kind of tend to traditionally think of as, as the full time number of hours, suddenly people's earnings increase very, very quickly. Um, there's this kind of discontinuity. Um, and that's the kind of, and what is interesting about that is that this is, um, so on the left, we have kind of in the 19th, so I, I did this by sort of the, the periods where we have the different SOC codes so that I could um, kind of control for, for, um, uh, for occupation kind of consistently. Um, so, so this is the kind of the 90s on the left and the 2010s on the right. Um, and that that shape of that hours earnings profile is, is very similar. I um, mean, that hasn't changed very much. So though the, the part-time pay penalty has changed, that um, discontinuity is, is still there. Um, and what I want to, so where I'm moving now um, is, is to think about what it is that creates that, that discontinuity. Um, so we know that part-time work is, is very concentrated in some industries, uh, hospitality, service, um, and there's, there's evidence to show that it's associated with lower occupational skill requirements. They're more jobs with, with, with lower skill requirements are more likely to be part-time. Um, and I want to think about if it's related to the different types of, of tasks that um, part-time workers do at work. So maybe it's that jobs with more sort of coordination and analyzing longer tasks are more likely to be full-time and maybe those with shorter, more defined tasks are more likely to be part-time. Um, and what I've started to do, and I'd, I'd be really interested to hear from anyone who, who's thought about this before, is to link the occupational data in the um, LFS to this um, ONET, which comes from the States, database of, of occupational task requirements. Um, and then the, sort of I'm beginning to investigate which types of task can predict whether someone works part time and, and which types of task are associated with with a higher part time pay penalty. Um, yes, and then I think I've got a few minutes left, so I'm just going to briefly talk about the kind of structural model of part-time and full-time work that, I, that I'm building. Um, and as I said, the aim of the model is, is to, to explain work, both workers and firms' preferences for full-time versus part-time work, um, and, and to incorporate that, um, that shape of the, the wage distribution that we see, the earnings distribution that we see. Um, and then the aim is, is to use that model to try and, and think about whether the changes that we see are driven by changes in work preferences. So maybe people want more part time work than they did or whether they're driven by changes in firm technology. So maybe the kinds of, of work that, that we increase uh, that we have now are just um, more kind of amenable to being done part time and, and firms are demanding more part time workers. Um, so just to give you a very quick, I'm not going to kind of show you the model in any detail, um, but to give you a very quick idea of how it works. The idea is to simplify things and to, to say that firms produce using a combination of, of output from two occupations. Uh, and there's a kind of, I, I call it, sim, I don't like that term, but I call it simple occupation, where all the tasks are very well defined and they all have the same length. And then there's a, a more kind of more complex occupation where tasks are less well uh, um, less well defined. They have a sort of a length that can vary and, and is uncertain. On the firm side, it's a kind of neoclassical model. Firms decide how many workers to employ and how, and how many hours. Um, and workers decide which, which occupation and how many hours. And then uh, market clearing gives you some, some equilibrium earnings in, in both the occupations. And what I find is that people who, in the model, people who, who want to work part time because they've got a high disutility of labour, they sort into those simple occupations um, and they work for, um, for fewer hours in those simple occupations. And then people with a, with a high disutility of labour, so with a low disutility of labour who, who want to work more hours, they sort into the more complex occupations um, and they work more hours in those and they earn a higher hourly wage. And that's where that difference, that part-time pay penalty comes from. 
Um, and then the idea is is to to calibrate the model and to look at whether the how the changes in parameters can drive changes in in the relative wages and the relative quantities of part and full time workers. Um, so just to kind of to plot that out and um, perhaps make it a, a little clearer. Um, so so what this is the kind of this is in in the equilibrium of the model. This is the the earnings as a function of hours. So so as you work more hours on the um, on the horizontal axis, your earnings on the, are on the um, vertical axis. And for the simple occupations, that's that straight line, those earnings are linear. Um, but for the, the complex occupations, those earnings are convex. So as you, as you work more hours, your hourly wage increases. Um, and then the, the green lines here are some, work, some utility indifference curves for some workers. Um, so U1 is the utility indifference curve for a worker with a, a very high disutility of labour. And you see that for them, it makes sense they earn more if, if they work in the simple occupation um, and they do that for a few hours. But then U3 is the utility indifference curve for um, someone with a very low disutility of labour. And you see that they can earn more if they work in the complex occupation and they choose a higher number of hours and their hourly wage, which is um, is higher. And so this gap between the two is, is the part-time pay penalty that we observe. And yes, yeah, so, so, so just to sum up, um, so the, the kind of the conclusion so far of this project is that there has been this long-term increase in, in both the quantity um, and the relative price of part-time work. Those trends are much more, it's, that's being driven mostly by men. Um, uh, and that's um, kind of suggests that, that maybe there are sort of differences in um, in preferences for men men and women that might be important, um, and then what I've done so far is is to create a model that replica can replicate that um, that part time pay penalty, and um, and and kind of suggest how people might sort into into full time and part time work. Um, I've talked a little bit about my plans to to extend the the empirical work, um, and I also plan to extend the model. Um, so at the moment, everybody in my model has the same um, productivity, um, but in fact, obviously that's that's not the case. Um, and so, kind of extending it, and that would allow people to work very long hours in low in low pay occupations, which which we do see in the data. It's not the case that everyone in, in low wage occupations. Uh, works very few hours. Um, and then the other extension is to kind of incorporate um, gender differences in preferences. So maybe then we can start to explain why some of these trends are, are different for men and for women. Um, but yeah, but that was all that I wanted to to talk about today. So so thank you very much for listening. Um, and I, I, I'm sort of, yeah, I'll be interested in any comments or, or any questions that you have. So thank you. Thank you, Rachel. Um, that was really interesting. I learned a lot. Um, so uh, we do have a question um, from Andrew. Um, he says, thank you for your interesting presentation. And he has two questions. So how are you going to convert the US ONET data into UK SOC codes? Um, uh, yes, um, that turns out to, yes, that's <laughs> an excellent question. Um, so what I do at the moment is I map them to ISCO codes. Um, and then I, I map those ISCO codes to SOC codes. I'm aware that that's not ideal. Um, I don't know if that's something that, that you've worked on at all. Um, I'm definitely looking for a better way to do that, um, for sure. Oh, I think there was a second question. Um, that is, um, have you looked at whether part-time workers have a second job? Um, so, yeah, so sorry, I should have put that on the kind of extensions. Um, the percentage of people with, with a second job is, is fairly stable. Um, but one thing I, I want to look at is whether the kind of the total hours for those people has been increasing or decreasing and whether it's the case that people kind of are increasingly moving to having sort of one main part time job and then a smaller part time job on the side. Um, obviously, that then feeds into whole sorts of things about kind of we, we've you know, um, something that is very kind of prominent at the moment is is the idea of the gig economy and and whether um, people are kind of have a main job and then a sort of gig job on the side. So that's definitely something I'm looking into at the moment. Fantastic. Right. Well, uh, I think it's time to move on. But thank you very much for your talk, Rachel. Thank um, you. Okay. So our next speaker then is uh, Mark Bryan. 
Well, let me have a look. So yes, Mark is going to be talking about decomposing the disability employment gaps in the UK, the role of education. Um, so Mark is a reader in economics at the University of Sheffield, and his research centres on health, wellbeing and work, and is based on the statistical analysis of large scale data sets. And he's currently leading a Nuffield Foundation project on unpacking the disability employment gap. Okay, then. So when you're ready, over to you, Mark. Okay, thanks. I'm probably looking at the wrong screen because they say it's on my right hand screen, which is not where the camera is. But anyway, we'll carry on. Um, so, yeah, this is um, joint work with Andy, who just asked the question there, uh, Jenny and Christina, my colleagues here at Sheffield. Um, and Andy actually did all the analysis in the in the secure lab. Um, so this is part of a large Nuffield project, um, which is about unpacking the disability employment gap. And what we're doing here in this uh, particular analysis is focusing on the role of education and asking the question, potentially how could changing education uh, affect the disability employment gap? So what is the disability employment gap? Um, it's the difference between the employment rates of disabled people and non-disabled people. So if you take 2019 before the pandemic in the UK, um, among working age non-disabled people, 81% um, of them were employed, whereas the employment rate was only 53% among disabled people. So the difference between those is this 28 percentage points uh, em disability employment gap. And what we aim to do in this, and, and this, this is um, quite a hot policy issue. The government's concerned about it. They, in the past, had a, had a target to halve the disability employment gap. Um, disability rights advocates and charities are also um, interested in it because they want to get rid of the structural barriers to employment uh, of, of disabled people. Um, so what we're aiming to do in this particular analysis is to try and disentangle this gap into the bit that is because people are different. So the characteristics of disabled uh, people are different from potentially different from the characteristics of non-disabled people. Uh, in addition to the difference in, in their health status. And secondly, the part that is, is because people um, are treated differently or behave differently uh, in the labour market. And so we're calling those differences structural differences or structural barriers. Um, and we are focusing on education because this is a so-called modifiable characteristic that also is itself um, the target of policy. So, Disability is a protected characteristic under the Equality Act of 2010. So it's illegal to discriminate in employment matters. Um, but nevertheless, you can see that on that diagram there, the disability employment gap is much bigger than the equivalent gaps uh, between men and women or between white people and people from ethnic minorities. So why is this? Uh, could it be that despite this legislation, there's discrimination in the labour market? That would be an example of a structural barrier. Could it be that um, having a disability inherently makes you less productive and employable than not having a disability? Um, could it be that disabled people tend to have lower qualifications and skills than non-disabled people? So that's something that we are, we'll be able to address in this research looking at education. Or could it be that Disabled people are employable, just as employable as non-disabled people, but it's just that there's a lack of workplace accommodations and other adjustments in, in the wider society, which prevents them from taking up jobs. So that would be another structural barrier. Um, and then finally, could it be that disabled people are less likely to participate in the labour market, to, to choose not to participate in the labour market, and so they're less likely to be in work than non-disabled people? I don't think anybody's and nobody's suggesting that work is appropriate for all disabled people. So there may be an element of a decision or choice in, in this gap. So we'd never expect that gap to be down to zero. This shows um, the how that gap is varies over different educational qualifications. So you can see here there's a very sharp uh, educational gradient. Um, going from, if we take people with no qualifications, then the disability employment gap is 40 percentage points and it goes down to 14 percentage points for people with a degree. So those green figures are the, are the 2019 figures. 
If you just take the ends of that, you can see that actually the gradient got even steeper uh, between 2014 and 2019. Um, so there's this very large, so clearly education is, is playing some kind of role here because there's this very steep educational gradient. If you take those figures and you weight them or multiply them by the percentage of people in each category, uh, then if you add those segments together, you'll get the full disability and employment gap. So that's what we've, we've done here. Um, there are now 11 categories. These are the 11 uh, academic and vocational qualification categories that we're going to be using in the analysis. But for example, if you take the, that top left segment, the 25%, uh, that's a function of the 40 percentage point gap for people with no qualifications that I just showed you and the number of people who are in that category. So one way to think of this is that if we eliminated the gap for people with no qualifications, then that would shrink the overall disability employment gap by 25%. So this is one way that can kind of inform how we might want to target policy on, on, different, on different groups. And I'll come back to this later on when we talk about the structural gap. So this is the overall gap at the moment. Um, the data that we're using are from the APS in 2019, and we're not using the full working age population because we don't. We, we only want to look at people who finish their full time education, so we're limiting it to people who are 25 or older, um, and that means that our disability gap will be a bit larger than the 28 percentage points that I had in the in the earlier slide, uh, because the older you go, uh, the bigger the gap. So we're, it'll, it'll turn out to be 33 percentage points. We're defining disability using the two questions in the LFS APS that enable you to construct the same definition as in the Equality Act. So, um, yeah, that's whether you have a long, a long term health problem or illness and whether that reduces your ability to carry out day to day activities. Um, we're including self employed people here. So, it's whether someone is either an employee or self employed. And uh, we have our 11. Um, academic and vocational qualifications, which I just showed you in, in that donut. Um, and then we're including a bunch of other demographic characteristics that are listed there at the bottom of the slides. Now, I can't and don't have time to go through this uh, in any sort of detail, but basically what we're doing here is no Saka Linder decomposition. So we're basically estimating employment equations um, that show how much qualifications, which are the Qs, and uh, the, other, the other characteristics, the X is how much they affect people's probability of being in employment and the betas there are those effects or the returns to those characteristics. Um, we then take the averages after estimating the equation and take the difference of those averages, which gives us the DEG. And then by rearranging these algebraic terms, you can apportion um, parts of the gap to differences in characteristics, so education and other characteristics, or the differences uh, in these in these returns, the betas, um, so the the impact of the different characteristics, and that's what we're calling the, the structural component. Now, there's lots of different ways you can actually do this because ultimately it's just kind of it's just almost like a an accounting exercise or a statistical decomposition, and one contribution of our paper is we're trying to clarify how you actually interpret these things. So what I'm going to do for, uh, I haven't got time to discuss that now, but what I'm going to do for the rest of the presentation is whiz through some tables and just select particular numbers and ask you to take it on trust that those are the right, the, the right numbers to select and, and the most meaningful, the most meaningful figures to give you. So um, this is the first table and the key numbers here are the differences in the means, looking at the differences in qualifications between disabled and non-disabled people. And really the big differences are at the two ends here. So what you can see is that for, if you take degrees, 39% um, of non-disabled people have a degree and it's only 24% of disabled people. At the other end, if you take no qualifications, 6% of non-disabled people don't have a qualification and that's 17% among disabled people. Uh, the other qualifications in the middle are much more equally distributed, but so it's really at these two ends where we see this big difference. So the question for us is, is this, is this big gap in um, degree level uh, qualifications and no qualifications, is that driving the disability employment gap? So this is our first decomposition table and we'll 
give us some, some information on that. So what you see there at the top uh, is that there's overall this 33 percentage point gap. And if we look at the proportion of the, the part of that that's due to differences in education, that's just four percentage points, which is 12% of that gap. And that's driven, uh, as you would expect from that previous table, by these differences in degree and no qualifications, more or less, more or less equal contributions there. Um, another way to think of this is in terms of a sort of counterfactual or a thought, kind of thought experiment, policy thought experiment, where what we try and do is uh, increase pe disabled people's qualifications to the level of non-disabled people, um, leaving the structural barriers in place. And if we did that, this is telling us that, th that it would reduce the gap by four percentage points or 12%. If we do another thought experiment and forget about increasing uh, education, but think about trying to dismantle some of the structural barriers, then what this column here tells us is that we could potentially uh, reduce the gap by 28 percentage points. Um, so that's 85% of the gap, although that does include some of the, some of the, um, the, the preferences to work that I talked about earlier, which I'll, I'll come on to later. So obviously that's a huge, huge amount. Um, what we can do is look at how that 28 percentage points is distributed across the different qualifications. So the left-hand column here is essentially doing a similar thing to what we did in the donut earlier on, where we look at how that structural gap uh, now is distributed across qualifications. So what the number there at the top for degrees says is that if we took people with degrees, and we, we were able to eliminate the structural differences or the structural barriers, then that would take uh, 4.6 points off the total gap, of the total structural gap of 28 percentage points. So that's 16% of, that, uh, of that gap. If we uh, did the same thing for people with no qualifications, so, that the same, so if we took the 17% of disabled people with no qualifications and removed the structural barriers, that would get rid of 6.5 points or percentage points of the gap, so 23%. Um, so again, that's telling us something about how we might want to target different policies. Um, now that structural gap I've just been talking about there, there as I said, includes preferences. Um, and to get a handle on that and how much, how much they're actually coming into influencing this, We've tried to narrow it down by defining an, a so-called involuntary disability employment gap. Now, we're not too sure about the name here. We've, we've in the latest iteration of the paper, we're calling it a want to work gap um, because the way this is defined is, is, is we now do, we do the same analysis, the same calculations, but for people who are not working, we only include people who are ILO unemployed. So by definition, they're looking for work. People who are not ILO employed, they don't satisfy the full criteria, but they're so they're inactive, but they're still seeking work. And people who are inactive and not seeking work, but say they would like work. And these are taken from this variable in LFS APS INEC AC05, which is a big list with this multitude of different economic activity categories. And so what we can safely say is that in this sample, um, calculating the, the gap in this way, choice shouldn't be coming into it because all of these people say they are they would like to work. And you can indeed see that the gap is much smaller. It's now half what it was before overall. But if we look into the decomposition, we still find that 92% of that is structural. So despite the fact that choice isn't playing a role here, we're still finding that 92% is structural. And in fact, that's higher than it was before. And looking at education, if we tried to, to equalize education, we'd close the gap by 8%. So uh, again, in fact, that's smaller than it was, it was before. So this is, this is some evidence here that um, it isn't just choice that's affecting whether um, disabled people get into work or not. I'll skip that slide for reasons of time and just go on to the conclusions. I guess we haven't really at this stage got a list of policies and we're not, we're not quite at that stage yet, but I think this is providing some useful pointers for policy. Um, if we just looked at education and didn't try and reduce structural barriers, we could reduce, we could make a dent in the gap, but it wouldn't be a huge dent. We, we're talking about something like 12%. 
it would be bigger for women, which I haven't had time to show you, but essentially the, that overall conclusion doesn't, doesn't change that much. So what we're seeing here is the importance of these so-called structural barriers that make up about 85% of the overall gap. Um, and even when we go to the, 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 the so-called involuntary disability employment gap, um, then uh, we still find it that that's driven by, by, by these structural preferences. We can look at the structural, how, 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 the structural, um, how the structural barriers differ over qualifications. And what that shows is, is that, one, is that if, we, if we address them for people with no qualifications, then that would probably have the greatest single impact on the disability employment gap. So I think I'll, I'll finish there. And um, that's the, the link to our main project there, if anybody's interested in, in finding out more. Okay, thank Great. Well, thanks very much then, uh, Mark. And I will move on now to our last speaker of this session. So, um, uh, no Jin, um, who also known as Dan, um, comes from the university. He's coming from the um, University of Cardiff, Cardiff University, and he's a PhD in economics candidate at Cardiff Business School. And his PhD research topic is measuring impacts of Brexit on migration and regional economic growth in Wales. So he holds an MSc in economics from the University of Illinois and is an active member of the Regional Studies Association. Okay, so over to you, Dan. Thank you so much. Hello, everyone. I'm Daniel. I'm currently a PhD candidate in economics at Cardiff University. And it's been an honor for me to have, the, have this opportunity and actually the, the, today's talk of my presentation is measuring the impact of Brexit on migration in UK in the case of Wales from, two, uh, from 2016 referendum to uh, 2022 uh, invasion. So I will divide my today's presentation into the five parts. The first part is introduction. So in this section, I'll introduce the history of Brexit as a political and economic agenda, debates regarding Brexit and its migration restriction policies very briefly, and most importantly, uh, reasons uh, why I chose Wales as the very case of my research project for the PhD thesis. I will start uh, this section uh, with uh, with a quote from former uh, president of European Commission by Jean uh, Jean Claude Juncker, who said that of course Brexit means that something is from Europe, but something is also that something I was from uh, in Britain. Now I'll talk about the history of Brexit from past to present very briefly. So as we can see that in this uh, this figure, which shows the uh, data of poll right before the 2016 referendum, I would say it's, it's just like a tight race because we can see that the approval rate of um, approval rates of remaining in EU and uh, leaving EU are, were quite close. But basically, the proposal of Brexit um, could, could date back to a 1975 referendum of leaving EC, the European Commission, the predecessor of uh, EU. So, and, and, and besides, um, uh, Euroscepticism began to grow since the 1990s and reached an extremely high level since 2004 EU Great Enlargement, which included six new countries in the EU. And then the uh, 2016 the Great Referendum just decided the Brexit um, to become a reality. And finally, we have experienced a transition period in time. time. Why migration matters to Brexit? So basically, as we can see in this figure, um, uh, come and go, uh, migration to and from UK during this period, we can see that the number of EU migrants to UK increased very rapidly. And uh, EU migrants started to uh, occupy more than 50% of total migrants to UK in 2014, roughly right here, right after the last two EU expansions, 2007 and 2013. So uh, some economists claim that the migration issue ran that, and some uh, economists claim that this uh, trend, this is this historical trend, uh, could explain why the migration issue ran top three with high weights of major Brexit arguments in many polls before the European. So how did uh, Brexit um, reshape the migration policy uh, here in UK? And um, so, uh, according. According to the uh, final agreement between UK and EU regarding uh, to Brexit, uh, all, all migrants to UK uh, are now divided into three categories as shown in the uh, table. So basically all EU migrants now have to apply for point-based workers visa uh, after Brexit. And, and it is very important to notice that before Brexit, they didn't have to apply for uh, workers visa to get a migration status. And so for non EU EU migrants, uh, only non-EU migrants earning uh, no less than 25,600 uh, pounds per annum can apply for the point-based workers. 
So basically, um, many economists also claim that migrants from EU countries to UK are estimated to be um, more impacted by uh, Brexit-related restrictions on migration than uh, those from non-EU countries. And last but not least, so we have experienced the 2020 COVID-19 pandemic and uh, more importantly, 2022 uh, Russian invasion of Ukraine that could bring uh, unexpected impacts on migration to UK and to Wales as well. So then I will explain why I chose Wales uh, as a case of this, of my research project. I will give major two reasons. First reason is a strong economic and trade relationship between uh, Wales and the EU. So as we can see in both, in both charts that uh, the strong trade relationship between EU and Wales exceeded almost all other economies. So uh, Portis in 2002 claimed that Wales has one of the strongest trade and economic ties with the EU region among all UK subregions such as Northern Ireland and uh, Scotland. And the second part is just like um, just like uh, mm, what many uh, economists have claimed, including Hoover in 1969, claimed that uh, migration decisions are highly motivated by economic ties between moving and move out countries. So as we can see in this chart, um, showing the, the number of migrants to Wales from 2010 to 2020, so we can see that the um, Wales and EU share a close relationship regarding migration, and Wales has become, according to the data from Stats Wales, Wales has become the second most um, popular destination for EU migrants to UK since 2005. Finally, uh, country literature on Brexit's impact on migration to Wales is it's quite inadequate, I have to admit. And so I would like, I hope to uh, contribute to this topic with more empirical results. Finally, uh, my research questions are these three. First one, how did Brexit impact migration patterns to Wales after this referendum? And can these impacts be differentiated with respect to other external shocks such as the pandemic and the war in Ukraine? Second, to what extent will Brexit impact and reshape future migration patterns to Wales? And then uh, finally, uh, what public policies, especially migration related administrative policies can Welsh government implement to assure health, so-called health, healthy and balanced uh, migration governments? governance uh, proposed by the Conservative. And so then I'll go through uh, the uh, two major models and methodologies that were used. Uh, the first one is to review previous data and to check whether Brexit had, in, had impacts on migration to Wales. So basically I'll use FEBD-based gravity model. So it's based on an extension form of the cl classical gravity model of migration, just like, uh, the general form uh, of original model is shown below. So we can see that MIJ is, is migration from region I to region J. Um, so P, I, P, J are, are uh, population sizes for both regions and D, I, J is distance. So X, S, J uh, means pole factors and X, S, I means push factors uh, consistent with the uh, definitions of classical model. So then take the log linearized form and we can get this equation. And then we're going to FEVD methods. So basically, Palmer and Choker um, developed this method, fixed effect vector decomposition method to allow estimations of time invariant variables. In my model, it's just like, uh, which is very important, uh, such as in distance between moving and move out regions based on an, based on an FE, FEM setup. So according to my previous calibration of this model, so this FED method is highly consistent with economic requirements of, of my model, especially for some variables such as distance and location, so which makes it a powerful estimator. Finally, the uh, empirical model is just like as follows. So here, uh, P is uh, P means population, D is distance, U is it means unemployment rate, uh, I here is the mobile region, J as well. So G is uh, GDP per capita uh, in both regions. And EU, this is a very important variable, which checks whether the country of uh, the move out, re move out country belong to uh, EU, uh, or namely had the free movement rights to UK at time T minus one. And here COVID, uh, this variable is also very important. It checks whether uh, COVID pandemic had some uh, endogeneity bias uh, to the, uh, uh, to the process of, of regression of this program. So as I have mentioned, so MIJT will be it will be divided into three groups and uh, regression analysis repeated four repeated four three times in accordance with top three industries receiving most uh, migrant labor in Wales to check whether uh, there are some heterogeneity issues um, in different industries. And then to forecast the um, future trends of migration to us, I use the Niger model code developed by the National Institute of Economic and Social Research and College Business School. And it also uses the uh, spatial DSG approach. 
So all the all variables used in Niger model are identical to those used in FVD based gravity uh, model, uh, except one extra dummy variable, which is uh, Ukraine IT minus one to check whether the move out country is contiguous to Ukraine, because uh, numerous papers have estimated that Russian invasion of Ukraine could last four months, uh, causing um, possible impacts on Russian decisions for the so basically, uh, we're going to data. I use these four major data sources: LFS data, migration and survey data from Wales, from Swiss Wales, the virtual COVID nineteen database, World Bank database, and finally, uh, in this section, I will introduce three uh, major parts of uh, of uh, results: so descriptive statistics and, and empirical results of uh, those models. First is descriptive uh, statistics. So uh, note that all descriptive statistics about have not been locally realized, but logarithmic values. Uh, would uh, were applied in modeling to make it easier for regression analysis and to make uh, to eliminate uh, any uh, statistical bias. So as we can see, this uh, is, it, it shows the uh, result of FEVD based gravity model. And first, generally, more people in the move out country contribute to more migration from this country to Wales. And you can see the coefficient of British population move out PI uh, in three um, regression analysis. Uh, processes are were, uh, were all uh, positive and then distance dis discouraged migration because the coefficient were all uh, negative and then higher employment unemployment rate in the move out country contribute to more migration to us and then migration to wealth tended to be from regions with lower gdp per capita to the region with higher gdp per capita names wells and then uh, this uh, note that this second column is to, tech, uh, to is to test whether the EU free uh, movement had impact uh, in the process of um, Brexit uh, on on migration and to and, and con to to control for other variables right here. So basically, um, results show that EU free movement attracted migration, uh, just like as it, as it's shown uh, in this. Um, Table and um, and and for the set the second column shows shows the uh, two, uh, the second column tests whether COVID nineteen pandemic imposed any uh, endogeneity bias uh, or has uh, or had impacts on migration decisions to UK and without show that COVID nineteen surge caused risks of migration. There are some discussions. So basically, I also conducted further analysis on whether Brexit led to changes in the number of EU or non-EU migrants in three categories and top three industries, namely manufacturing, industry, education, and finance. In Wales, as, as mentioned, I repeated the regression pre procedure for uh, six times in total, and results show that the number of EU migrants earning less than thirty thousand uh, pound per per annum in the manufacturing industry uh, decreased most significantly due to uh, Brexit-related migration consequences. Also, continue uh, to test whether the uh, 2016 uh, referendum caused perceptual concerns of abolishing uh, EU and UK free movement. I also inter inserted another dummy variable, just like EU IJ, uh, to, to test whether the mobile country belonged to EU at time T. So we also show that uh, to the referendum contributed to a rapid increase in the number of EU migrants in Wales, and such causal effect is statistically significant. Also, to test the robustness of whether COVID-19 brought the endogeneity issue, I also inserted three IV, but uh, uh, no statistically uh, significant, significant coefficients for these three IV were found, showing that COVID-19 did not impose endogeneity to changes in migration patterns. Um, next part, uh, I use the Nigerian uh, model to forecast the future trend of uh, migration to wells, as it's showing this chart. Uh, so from uh, 2021 to 2026, so it shows that uh, EU migrants are expected to uh, increase uh, rapidly um, in 2022 and remain at a high level of increase until 2024. So uh, as also for non-EU migrants, they are expected to increase uh, steadily from uh, 2021 to 2025 and experience a slight decrease in um, Yes. Finally, I also use the ArcGIS and GeoNames tools to um, um, to give um, a big picture of geographic um, divergence of migration to us uh, in the future in, in, in the given period from 2021 to 2026. So here we can see that uh, in major cities and economic centers in Wales, such as Cardiff right here, Newport right here, and Swansea, um, all of the cities uh, are expected to, are expect to uh, receive more uh, EU and non-EU uh, migrants in the future during this period. Uh, there are also some discussions. Uh, previous, pre previous literature also noted that the industrial uh, heterogeneity could lead to regression 
you know, focus bias. But uh, for my research project, um, the current version of well-spaced Niger model has not included such approach or data to forecast how migrants would change their migration decision uh, migration decisions to wells. Basically, if I would like to conduct such a research that requires difference in different methods and especially more importantly the firm or individual level data in the near future uh, uh, in, uh yeah and an individual level data so basically major model uh, will include uh, this data in the near future okay so i'll conclude uh, my presentation with these four points first one is brexit according to my uh, empirical analysis and empirical analysis brexit have causal effects on the reduction on uh on, uh, of eu migrants to us in major industries especially after the referendum Second, uh, Brexit did not impact non-EU migrants to wealth in major industries, possibly due to the plans of losing uh, immigration policies, uh, such as the extension of PSW visa starting in 2018 and the start of BNO visa application from Hong Kong starting in 2020. Second one is uh, EU migration expected to be encouraged by 2022 Ukrainian war, and according to many um, economists and uh, researchers, it could be this war could, could last for at least one year. Uh, to, um, Due to the uh, current situation, so uh, we ex ex uh, so I expect that uh, the impacts of uh, Ukrainian war on migration to UK could also last for at least one year due to the perpetration. Finally, um, uh, my suggestion is just like uh, the Welsh government um, maybe have to um, uh, cooperate to uh, co to cooperate with uh, UK Home Office to develop a balanced and merit-based immigration policy that meets the requirement of, of economic growth and uh, industrial uh, transformation, and more importantly, the different uh, the uh, uh, the dynamic uh, I'm sorry the dynamic structures of uh, migration to us. Thank you so much, and that's all of my today's presentation. Please feel free to ask questions and.